Hello Brain Nerds, my name is Jace and welcome to the Big Brain Busters. So in this video we are going to talk about plasma membrane channels and transport across the cell membrane. So now talking about plasma membrane channels, these are just simply channels that allow for transport of different substances across the cell membrane. There are many channels or carrier proteins that are embedded into the cell membrane that allow for transport of these substances. So they allow for movement of different substances across the cell membrane and the different types can be water channels which allow for water to, to pass through the cell membrane or you can have solute channels or solute carriers that, that allow solutes such as glucose and other solutes to pass through the cell membrane. Then you have ion channels which allow for charged particles such as sodium, magnesium and these other uh, potassium to go through the cell membrane. Then you have ATP dependent channels. So these are channels that are actually dependent on ATP for transport of different substances. So now let's talk about the water channels. The water channels are known as aquaporins and these water channels they are distributed widely in different body parts and uh, such body parts can be the brain, the lungs, the kidneys, salivary glands and in the gastrointestinal tract and the liver. So these aquaporins allow for transport of water and there are different types known as multiple isoforms of aquaporins that are found in different locations. So for example, you have in the cells of the collecting ducts of the kidneys, you have the aquaporin 3 and aquaporin 4 that are found on the basolateral part of the membrane. Then you have aquaporin 2 that are found on the apical part of the membrane. So these are the types of aquaporins that are found in the collecting ducts of the kidneys and they allow for reabsorption of water or secretion of water into the lumen. So this is what we mean. So you have this part here. So you have the luminal part. So this is the part of the collecting duct. This is the tube of the collecting duct. Then this is the cell. Okay, the epithelial cell of the collecting duct. And you have the, bl the blood vessel this side where you have blood. So it's either. So you have these um, aquaporins that are found there. So this is the luminal part and this is the uh, basolateral part. So you have the luminal part or the apical part where you have aquaporin 2. So in this aquaporin 2, it allows for movement of water to enter into the cell. Okay, And when water enters into the cell, via aquaporin 3 and 4, water can move out of the cell into the blood in that form. Okay, So this is what we mean. And these are the water channels that are found there. Then now let's talk about the ion channels. When you talk of ion channels, you simply talk about the channels that transport charged particles. And uh, they are important for maintaining ion balance in and out of the cell. So the ion balance or the homeostatic balance of ions should be balanced um, in the extracellular compartment and the intracellular compartment. So these ion channels can be classified according to three characteristics. They can be classified according to the selectivity, or which simply means the nature of ion that pass through the channel. So what kind of ion? Is it, is it um, sodium? Is it potassium? So certain channels can be very selective such that they only allow one type of ion to pass through them but then some channels can be less selective that means that they can only they can allow any type of ion to pass through them then another characteristic of ion channels is simply conductance so conductance simply means the number of ions that pass through the channel so some cha some ion channels can allow only one ion and some can allow many ions to pass through them then another characteristic is known as gating or simply um, the operation of an ion channel based on um, what what can open it and what can close it okay so that these are known as gated channels so there are um, types of gated channels so you have the voltage gated ion channel so the voltage gated ion channel is controlled by voltage 
So its opening and closing of this channel is controlled by voltage. So this is an example that I can give. So as you can see, this ion here, this ion channel is closed in this case. Then when, when a certain voltage has been reached, this ion channel can be opened because that voltage has been reached. An example I can give is that of um, excitable tissue, uh, excitable cells. Um, in terms of action potential. So during action potential, what happens is that there is sodium influx into the cell. And as sodium is entering into the cell, meaning that there is a raise of a voltage because the um, resting membrane potential of um, what is of uh, normal cells is negative 70 millivolts. Now, if, that, if there is influx of sodium into the cell, that negative 70 millivolts is being raised and then when the threshold voltage is reached and that is negative 55 there is opening of fast ion of fast sodium ion channels where now more sodium can enter into the cell and the sodium ion channels can uh, will become open and more sodium can enter before threshold before voltage threshold is reached those channels are closed and those are known as voltage gated channels which are opened due to certain uh, due to certain voltages then now we can talk about another vot uh, gated channel known as a ligand gated ion channel it is controlled by extracellular agonists or an antagonists so agonists are simply substances that um, bind to that ion channel and cause um and in short, they will encourage the action of that channel. Then an antagonist will work opposite to that ion channel. Okay, so now in this case, these ligands, what happens is that there should be a substance known as a ligand for that channel to open. For example, as you can see here, this channel is closed because there is no ligand to be bound there. But then if a ligand binds there, this channel will be opened and this is known as a ligand gated channel it's actually ligand with one eye then other channels other gated channels are simply mechanical uh, due to mechanical stretch so when there is too much mechanical stretch certain ions certain ion channels are actually opened okay so now let's talk about transport across the cell membrane now that we've talked about all the um, membrane channels that can be that can be found in the plasma membrane. Let's talk about how these substances can be transported across the cell membrane. So transport across the cell membrane can occur through downhill or uphill. So with downhill transport, it occurs along the concentration gradient by diffusion, because in this case, it is going in a region where it is of high concentration to a region where it is low concentration. So that's why we call it downhill. Okay. And in this case, there is no energy required. Then uphill transport occurs against the concentration gradient and uses energy because in this case, it's like you're going to a place where there is more concentration of that substance, but then it is being taken there. So meaning that it requires energy to overcome that uh, concentration gradient. Okay. So now uh, a type of transport is known as simple diffusion this is a type of downhill kind of transport so under simple diffusion simple diffusion involves um you know diffusion of substances that are of non-electrolytes which are and uh, they are not charged these are non-electrolytes they are not charged okay so i'll give an example of this mem plasma membrane this is the extracellular compartment and this is the intracellular compartment okay so you have these non-electrolytes such as oxygen and carbon dioxide which are not charged so these substances can diffuse freely throughout this membrane without any challenges because they are not charged and anything like that okay so for these substances to enter here as you can see there is a high concentration and here there is uh, a low concentration so for these substances to enter in to cross through this cell membrane okay they can cross via simple diffusion and as you can see now 
that we had uh, 14 substances this side, then simple diffusion is occurring. Then simple diffusion will only stop when they are, when it reaches equilibrium. So when the substances this side and this side become equal, when equilibrium has been reached, that's when simple diffusion will stop, but substances will continue moving in and out. But then yet it is at equilibrium. So if we have seven this side, even the seven will be maintained this side. So that's how simple diffusion occurs. Okay. So examples of non-electrolytes are or uncharged particles are oxygen and carbon dioxide. I've already mentioned that. Then there is no specialized transporters for these molecules because they can freely cross through the cell membrane. Then now let's talk about another type of downhill. Um, transport which is known as facilitated diffusion so for facilitated diffusion it uses channels it uses carrier proteins for it to do what for it to carry out its function but then it's a type of diffusion in that it does not use it does it does not require any energy all right and for facilitated diffusion it can use it can transport electrolytes in this case, but it also involves transport of substances from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. So as you can see, we have the extracellular fluid compartment and the intracellular fluid compartment. So like I said, we are, you, we are transporting electrolytes from a region where it is highly concentrated to a region where it is low concentrated. Okay, so an example I have given is this channel here where we want to transport we want to transport what? Potassium in this case. So as you can see, we have more potassium ion on this side and less potassium ion on this side. So for this potassium to actually cross this uh, membrane, okay, in this case, it can be overcome by a gradient potential. So in this case, as you can see, potassium is a positively charged what? particle and you have also positively charged particles this side so if you have more positively charged particles and the potassium is a positive charged particle we know that there will be an opposite repulsion okay so if you have less charged particles uh, less positively charged particles and more positively charged particles on this side you find that potassium will be able to freely diffuse in this case like an example is here where we have more chloride ions this side and potassium ions this side. Potassium can easily diffuse into the other side, can easily efflux out of the cell into the other side because this side you have negatively charged ions, meaning that they can be attracted. So meaning even the rate of diffusion can actually occur faster. So what are some of the factors that actually um, affect the rate of diffusion? You have what? You have the uh, gradient potential. Then you have also the surface area. Okay, when you have a larger surface area, you also have an increase in the what in diffusion rate. Then the temperature also matters in that when you have high temperature, these particles that are diffusing gain high kinetic energy, so meaning that the rate of diffusion will be faster. Okay, and also the size of the particle. If the size of the particle is high, is 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 uh, big, you find that diffusion will be what will be slowed down. But then if the size of the particle is smaller you find that the rate of diffusion is actually faster okay so facilitated diffusion another example i am giving is that of the um, glute 4 channels so these are solute based channels okay so these are solute based channels and uh, i'll give an example of the skeletal muscle and adipose tissue so for facilitated diffusion to occur let's say for example you have Okay, so these are solid channels, GLUT4. So these are glucose transporter 4 channels, okay? And they are found in the skeletal muscle and adipose tissue. So if you have natural glucose being transported in your blood, in your blood vessel, for it, for, remember that we need glucose in our skeletal muscles to actually carry out contractions, our daily movements for the muscles to contract. So this glucose is actually transported via facilitated diffusion through this channel but it does not require what energy so it just freely crosses into the skeletal muscle and it can also freely cross into the adipose tissue like that okay then let's look at a type of uphill transport which is known as primary active transport so primary active transport 
it requires energy okay so this primary active transport it requires energy in that the carrier molecules that are involved require direct use of energy that is the difference between primary active transport and secondary active transport primary active transport requires direct use of energy from where from atp so in this case the energy form that we use in our bodies is known as adenosine triphosphate this adenosine tri triphosphate will be hydrolyzed into adenosine diphosphate and a what and an inorganic uh, phosphate so this is pi inorganic phosphate so this inorganic phosphate is the energy uh, phosphate molecule that is actually used to phosphorylate the channels so that they can carry out their functions so an example that i've given here is that of the what is that of the sodium potassium atipase channel so this sodium potassium atipase channel it requires this energy this energy phosphate to phosphorylate this channel so that it can carry out its function and how does the sodium potassium channel work it works by sending three sodium channels out on short efflux of three sodium channels and influx of two potassium channels this is um, against the concentration gradient because sodium is more inside the cell and less sorry sodium is more outside the cell and less inside the cell so since it is going to a place where it is more outside and less inside so it is going against its concentration gradient and same applies for what for potassium okay other examples of um, primary active transporters are the calcium atipase channel so the calcium the calcium atipase channel it helps in maintaining the interest the the what is the extracellular concentration of calcium and intracellular concentration of calcium as we know inside the cell the amount of calcium inside the cell should always be maintained uh, low it should always be low okay then another example so as you can see there we are using this high energy phosphate then another example of a primary active transporter is that of the what is that of the high a hydrogen pot a potassium atipase channel it also uses this high energy phosphate channel so these so the sodium potassium channel is present in all cell in all cells and responsible for maintaining a stable resting membrane potential then the calcium atipase channel is found in the sarcoplasmic reticulum of the muscles and the endoplasmic reticulum then the hydrogen potassium atipase channel is found in most in mostly the gastric pyreator cells and the alpha intercalated cells in the renal tubules so here it is responsible for maintaining the acidic balance in the stomach then secondary active transport this one uses indirect indirect energy okay that is the difference from from primary active transport is that secondary active transport uses energy but indirectly okay so how does it use energy indirectly i will explain so there are two types of secondary active transport types so you have core transport or symport and counter transport or antiport so let's look at the core transport or symport system so here the examples that I will use is that of sodium glucose core transporter. So to core transport meaning transporting together in the same direction. So this is the sodium glucose core transporter in the um, intestinal in the intestinal lumen. Okay. So here what is happening is that sodium and glucose are being transported together in the same direction. Now here is a, here is a question. How is this channel using energy for it to transport this? Okay, so how it is using energy to transport glucose is via the energy that is created by sodium. So sodium is moving, um, you know, sodium is moving along its concentration gradient. So what is happening is that the energy that is coming from uh, that is this that is being used by this channel is coming from the sodium potassium atps channel so what is happening is that this channel is producing energy okay for this channel to use so this is what is happening all right 
so yeah and uh, as so this is in the intestinal lumen this side so sodium and glucose will be transported via this channel into the cell then sodium now will be pumped or three sodiums will be pumped out and two potassiums will be pumped in by this channel the sodium potassium ATPs channel then the glucose channel now will diff will via facilitated diffusion cross freely from the cell into the blood and that is how glucose is absorbed into the blood system all right then other examples that i can talk about is the sodium amino acid co-transporter it also occurs in the same uh, process then so as the sodium potassium 2 chloride channel which of which is found in the um in the key in the renal tubules of the kidney all right then let's look at counter transport and this is a, and i'll use an example of the muscle cell so in counter transport counter transport means in the opposite direction and you can also refer to counter transport as antiport so in this case you find that uh, i'll use the the calcium sodium uh, counter transporter or antiport transporter all right and as usual we have the sodium potassium ATPase because in this case the mg that this channel uses is actually generated by the what by the sodium potassium um ATPase channel so what is happening is that for calcium to be pumped out of this cell calcium is pumped out of this cell and then sodium is pumped three sodiums are pumped in for one calcium three sodiums are pumped in and those three sodiums are pumped out of this cell by the sodium potassium ATPase and two potassium are pumped into the cell so this is counter transport in short transporting ions or substances in the op opposite direction so let's look at other transport systems across the cell membrane so you have other transport systems that occur and these are via endocytosis and endocytosis occurs in three types you have pinocytosis or cell drinking you have um, phagocytosis which is mainly used in the in, in fight in fighting uh, of infections in immunity then you have also the receptor mediated endocytosis so phagocytosis mostly is a receptor mediated type of endocytosis so to explain this concept of receptor mediated endocytosis so endocytosis simply means to um where a cell you know uh, forms certain kinds of um it forms certain kinds of vesicles whereby it is engulfing it is engulfing the what the substance that is supposed to enter into the cell and in this example i will use an example of where the um the macrophages which are a form of um you know uh, white blood cells and the neutrophils phagocytose these foreign bodies inside the cell so that they can actually do what they can kill those um foreign bodies so i'll use an example of receptor mediated type of phagocytosis to explain this concept so this is a diagram okay so what is happening is that you have receptors across the cell membrane here and these receptors are ready to bind with the what with the substance with the foreign body like, like a bacteria so these receptors here will be coated with adaptin a protein known as adaptin so when they have been coated there this foreign body will bind on this receptor then what will happen is that this cell membrane will start now uh, there are binding of other proteins known as clathrins so clathrins will start binding to the adaptin protein so as you can see here this green substance known as adaptin will be bound to clathrin as you can see there then there will be formation of a coated pit so there is a pit that will start forming here so this pit as it is forming it is allowing for binding of more of these substances here so as it is forming it is increasing in size then the next thing is that there will be a round formed substance known as a vesicle that will be formed then to separate this vesicle from the membrane here from this cell membrane so that this vesicle can be internalized or endocytosed into the cell what will happen is that dynamin a a what is a guanosine triphosphate atipase um, enzyme will come to separate this vesicle from the what 
from the cell membrane. Then this vesicle now will be transported. This coated vesicle, it is coated with what? With crathrin around it. So this coated vesicle now will be endocytosed. Then what will happen is that since now it is inside the cell, these clathrin proteins are done. Their, their function is done. So they'll start uh, you know, detaching from the adapting. And same as the adapting, it, they'll start detaching and then they'll be recycled back to the what? Back to the cell membrane to carry out other functions. So there is recycling of this. Then the substance that has been endocytosed, then it will, it will do what? It will be ready now to be bound to other um, molecules. So for example, in terms of the bacteria, it will be picked up by the lysosomes for um, you know, um, digestion and, and everything else. So this is all the process of receptor-mediated endocytosis. Then for exo another type of uh, transport is known as exocytosis, where a substance coming out, coming in, coming from the cell, it is removed out of the cell now, okay? It is the opposite of endocytosis. Then you have another process known as transcytosis, where a substance for example, if you have a cell here, this substance will be endocytosed into this cell. Then it will be now transported on the opposite side of the cell membrane. It will be moved out of the cell. So this is known as transcytosis. Okay, so it is a combination of endocytosis and exocytosis. Okay. Alright, so this is where we end our video. I hope you enjoyed and I hope you have understood. Don't forget to share, like and subscribe and also please drop a comment in the comment box so that I know um, your questions or any concerns that you have. So for now, we rest our case. Shalom, shalom. Thank you very much for watching.